Hi, what's happening folks? Uh, my name is Jeff Gotts and I'm here today to talk to you about correlation and linear regression. If you recognize any of these slides, it's likely that you've seen this textbook before, but the version where the letters go the right way. Uh, this is Basic Statistics for Business and Economics by Lynn Marshall and Wathan. Uh, thank you so much for using your textbook. Uh, props for props are due. Let's talk about the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to go through five things. First, we're going to give a quick primer on independent versus dependent variables. Second, we're going to talk about interpreting a correlation coefficient, go a little bit into visualizing it, uh, as well as basically what concept it's about. The third thing we're going to do is talk about uh, how to do a significance test for a correlation. So in between interpreting and doing the significance test, well, we're actually going to calculate one. Uh, the fourth concept is the extension of the correlation coefficient to the coefficient of determination. And lastly, we're going to look at how to calculate a regression equation, given some information from a bivariate data set, which is what correlations are all about. To start, uh, we need to talk about two types of variables, e independent and dependent variables. The reason we're talking about two types of variables here is because a correlation is what we call a bivariate relationship. In other words, bi meaning two and variate meaning variables, meaning there's two variables. Up until this point, we've been talking about univariate statistics. Means and standard deviation describe how one variable has some sort of centrality and dispersion. This is saying, all right, we've got two variables. Do those two variables relate to one another? In the case of an independent and dependent variable, we're suggesting that perhaps one of them, and that's the independent variable, causes a change in the dependent variable. So if you ever have two variables and you're trying to figure out which one's the independent and which one's the dependent variable, well, just put one before the other and put causes between them. For example, does the monthly amount health tech spends per month on training its sales force affect its monthly sales? In other words, does training cause an increase in sales or does an increase in sales cause more training? Yeah, that second one doesn't make a whole much of logical sense. Uh, second one, is the number of square feet in a home related to the cost to heat the home in January? So does an increase in number of rooms increase heating costs? cause an increase in heating cost? Well, yeah, that makes sense. If you live in a big place, it costs a lot to heat it. A small place might not cost you quite as much. But if you just decide I'm going to crank the thermostat up to 90 degrees, that's not going to make your place of living any bigger. Trust me, I've tried, but no, it doesn't work. The independent variable in that example is the number of square feet. As that thing changes, the cost of heating, well, that changes as a consequence, as a result. For example, we can look at an example of uh, two variables here. For any given person, we all have a size of our foot. For all of us, we may be able to read. Does having bigger feet help you to read better? Or perhaps does reading better help us to have bigger feet? Well, we go back to the independent and dependent variable example. We might think that, no, having bigger feet probably might, wait a minute, no. I don't think the size of my feet actually has anything to do with my reading ability. They are, in fact, correlated. In other words, people with bigger feet do have better reading ability. People with smaller feet tend to have less reading ability. Well, we look at this picture, and that should serve as a pretty good explanation. Now, big, big feet does not cause more reading ability, but as we get older, as the number of years we're around, and the more books we read, our reading ability gets better, and the more years we're around, our feet will grow as well. So ultimately, the cause for either of these things the cause, the independent variable, if you will, is going to be years. The more years you have, the more foot centimeters you have. The more years you have, the more words you have in the vocabulary. So your foot size is correlated with your reading ability, but it's not necessarily true that one causes the other. And that's a big difference that people often have to make when learning about correlations for the first time. Correlation is not causality. Just because two things vary together, co-vary, a similar related term to correlation is covariance, meaning things 
change together. Correlation is not causality. Things can vary together, but that doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. When we use the language of independent and dependent variable, we really imply, strongly imply, that the dependent variable is causally linked to the independent variable. In other words, as one increases, the other one will be caused to increase as well. Now that's causation. Causation requires correlation, but correlation does not require causation. Let's see if we can take this a little bit further into visualizing it mathematically. We're going to talk about two variables here. One of them is across the x-axis here. Let's say, for example, that's the size of your feet. Over here on the right-hand side, people with large feet. Perhaps we could say above average. If somewhere here in the middle is the average, to the right is above average, to the left is below average. But this is a bivariate relation, so we're going to have two variables. The second one we're going to have, we can say, is your reading ability. You can have a below average reading ability, or you can have an above average reading ability. This puts us in a place where we have four quadrants, four areas. This top right quadrant here indicate someone that might be above average on the x variable, the size of your feet, and above average on the y variable, your ability to read. So this might be someone like me. I've got some years, I've got some big feet, and I've got the ability to read. Someone down here might be like our baby Einstein before. Sure, the glasses in the book might look cute, but I assure you that that little baby has tiny feet and probably can't read at all. Below average on both foot size and reading ability. Now these are these two other quadrants here that are marked in red. Now this would be someone who has tiny feet but can read really well or someone over here who has giant feet but can't really read very well. How a correlation will work if we start with this visualization is to say things are positively correlated if we have a lot of things in the green boxes but not a lot of things in the red boxes. In other words, things that low, low goes together or high, high goes together, those things go together. If we have a bunch of those things, then we would say that they are positively correlated. If we have a bunch of things in the red quadrants, in other words, low and high or high and low, well, those are two examples of negative correlations. As one thing goes up, the other thing goes down and vice versa. We can have, and we will have in most data sets, some smattering of data points in all four of these quadrants. However, if we have more in the greens than we do the red, we tend to have a positive correlation. Further, if those things are further away towards the extremes as opposed to right near the origin, right in the middle, then those bigger differences are going to contribute more mathematically to the result. Mathematically is the next step now. If I'm above average on any variable, foot size, reading ability, you name it, and I have a mean score, let's say the average foot size is this. Well, if my foot size is this, the z-score for my foot size is going to be positive because a z-score of zero indicates the mean. So anytime I'm above average on a variable, then that variable, for me, I have a positive z-score. So I, with my big feet and giant vocabulary, have positive z-scores for both foot size and reading ability. That baby Einstein before had tiny feet and a tiny vocabulary. That would indicate to me negative z-scores for both of those. A negative yeah, positive Z, positive Z, negative Z, all that stuff I was explaining. Turns out, you multiply those things together and you see a consistent relationship in both those green and red quadrants. The consistency being those things that were high, high or low, low have a positive product of Z scores. A positive times a positive or a negative times a negative indicates a positive product. A factor times a factor is a product. Positive times a positive is a positive. Those things in the red, well, those are negative times a positive or positive times a negative. So that means it's negative, which is why we go back to calling these things either a positive correlation or a negative correlation because of the 
product, the sign on the product of the z-scores. But I also said that I'm going to have a whole bunch of these things. I'm not just going to have one person. I might have 10 people with varying foot sizes and varying reading abilities. If I've got a bunch of something, I probably want to add them all up and divide by how many there are. That's I don't know, it feels like one of the basic principles of statistics is that add them up and divide by how many there are. It turns out correlation falls right into that pattern as well. But thinking this through, to review the logic, each record, each person, each whatever thing we're going to look at, a different example in just a minute, has an X and a Y value if you have multiple variables. Uh, X could be reading, it could also be your foot size, it doesn't matter until we start talking about independent dependent variables. But each value, we have a, a value for an X and a Y score, and those can be converted to a Z score if we know the mean for your variable and its standard deviation. Well, therefore, each record has a product of its X and Y value. You can even convert those X and Ys to Z scores first, and we multiply those Z scores together. Well, yeah, we're going to add them all up, divide by how many there are. Well, minus one is actually what we divide by, which is practically how many there are. Yeah, and this big sigma right here, that means we're going to add up a whole bunch of things. What are the things that we're going to add up, though? This term to the right of the sigma is the thing that we're going to add up. For each record, we're going to take the z-score of x times the z-score of y for each record, for each person, for each business, for each whatever. We're going to multiply the z-scores together, and then we're going to add them all up. What we're not going to do is add up all the z-scores for the x variable, then add up all the z-scores for the y variable, and then multiply those together. You know why? Because that's always going to equal zero. You know why? Because anytime you add up a bunch of z-scores, all of the z-scores for a particular variable, all of the z-scores, you're going to get zero. The sum of the z-scores for one variable always equals zero. Zero times anything is zero, and that includes zero. Zero times zero, in other words, the sum of the z's for the x, the sum of the z's for the y, zero times zero equals zero. Wrong way to do it. We look at each individual record as a product of z-scores, and then we add those things up, divide by n minus 1, and we get a statistic that we call R. Maintaining that statistical alliterative advantage that we've given to these names, R means relation. It's technically Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient, sometimes the, called the coefficient of correlation, correlation coefficient. R means relation. Are these things related. Because it's our Latin letter, regular letter, if you will, R, well, that means it's a statistic, which means it comes from a sample. The corresponding population parameter is the Greek letter rho. We're going to see that a little bit later, but it's R-H-O rho. It kind of looks like a P that's tilted a little bit, that's got a short leg and a big head, but we'll get there in a second. R Correlation coefficient. Here's another example that doesn't involve babies or, or feet. The sales manager at Copier Sales of America wants to determine whether there's a relationship between the number of sales calls made in a month and the number of copiers sold that month. Wants to determine if there's a relationship. Doesn't know if it's positive or negative. Just wants to know, hey, is there a relationship between these two variables? The manager selects a random sample of 10 representatives listed here and determines the number of sales calls each rep made last month and the number of copiers sold by that rep. We can see here, we've got the reps, the number of sales calls, the number of copiers sold. We also have here, along the x-axis, the number of sales calls made, and on the y-axis, the number of copiers sold. Initially, when I look at that, I see that up here in the top right-hand portion of the data set, I've got things that are high number of sales calls and high number of copiers sold. Down here I have fewer number of sales calls made and fewer number of copiers sold. This begins to indicate to me it might be a positive correlation. Positive correlation we'll look at here now. It's the relationship R that measures the strength of relationship between two things. Here this picture indicates that there might be some relation what would a perfect relationship be? That's a great question for another time. But a perfect relation here indicates either a positive one or a negative one. 
A positive one is the highest value or negative one. The sign only indicates direction. Magnitude is indicated by the value. Uh, the strength of the relationship is the magnitude. One, zero, negative one would still have a magnitude of one because that's its distance from zero. Uh, zero indicates, uh, values close to zero indicates a weak correlation or no connection between the things. They are not related, while a value of one would indicate a perfect correlation. We can interpret the values along those lines as either being perfectly negative or perfectly positive. Here, this doesn't look perfect, but it certainly looks positive. If we get a value that's up here around 0.75, we might say it's strong and positive. Something around here, a 0.2, we might say it's a weak positive. Also, if it's a negative 0.2, it's got the same strength in that it's weak but its direction is now negative as opposed to positive. Our example from these copiers now might indicate something like a positive relationship. Now, it's not perfect because it's not a straight line, a perfect straight line, but there's definitely some pattern to it. So using that data, if we plot it here, noting that the mean for the number of sales calls is 22 and the mean for the number of copiers sold is 45, in fact, these three people up here who have the highest number of sales calls, and that would be Jeff Hall, Greg Fish, and uh, someone else, is, oh, Sonny Jones. Yeah, those three people have above average number of sales calls, and they all happen to have above average numbers of copiers sold. There's also six people down here who have below average numbers of sales calls who are also below the average in terms of number of sales. There's one person here who's got below average in terms of number of sales calls, but happens to have slightly above average number of copiers sold. But notice how close that is to the origin. One sales call here or there, one sale here or there, suddenly that person is on the other side of the axis. If we wanted to calculate that correlation coefficient, I showed you a formula earlier. The formula out of the textbook, well, it looks like this which is very, very similar to the formula that I showed you earlier. So similar, in fact, we can see here, x minus x bar over the standard deviation of x. Well, that would be the z-score for x. Yeah, a lot of the same things are here. Now, the reason there's so many different formulas for all these things, if you can think back before the time when we had computers, technology, and we got slide rules and abacuses, is we didn't always have all this information. Calculating square roots of things, which so much of this involves, was an arduous process. So a lot of times, if we wanted to calculate a statistic like the correlation, it would be useful to have a number of different formulas to solve the same statistic here. So we might have a number of different correlation formulas, and then we look at our data and say, okay, what do we have? Do we have the standard deviation of x? Do we have the cross? Well, what do we have? And then you choose your formula based on, on the information that you have. What would be most efficient formula to use the information that you have? But for us, we've got all this technology, so we don't need to worry about that as much. This formula is the one I prefer because I believe conceptually it gets us to thinking about correlation like this. And I think that's one of the easier ways to understand correlation. There's a number of different formulas. Some of them that start with the, there's a statistic called the covariance, which is a correlation, very, very similar, at least in terms of their names, but calculated slightly different. So there's a number of different ways that we can approach this. This is the formula that I think is conceptually appropriate for what we're doing today. Well, let's figure out how we can use this example to try to come up with our answer. There's a number of different demos on the Sakai website for the students in my class that discuss a number of things, uh, one of which there's a short video on independent versus dependent variables, which we discussed at the beginning. There's also something in there about visualizing correlation, showing a number of different shapes that data sets can have and how those different shapes translate to R, but ranging from positive one to negative one. If there's curvilinear data, how is that affected? There's also another example that shows you uh, something that I'm gonna talk about and demonstrate right now. In other words, how to use this formula to calculate a correlation. So if you wanna take a look at that video, do that as well. 
Uh, there's a couple more videos I'm going to allude to in just a little bit. But for now, I want to demonstrate how to use this data set to calculate our correlation coefficient. This is the same this is the same data set, not red, I won't wrap there. This is the same data set that we were just looking at here. Uh, there's a couple of statistics I want to start by calculating that we should always calculate, and that's the mean and the standard deviation. So I'm going to use average to get the mean of those data. In other words, the number of calls, hey, it turns out it's 22. I copy the formula over, mean is 45. We saw that before, that makes a lot of sense. The standard deviation I'm going to use is going to be the sample standard deviation. Why? Because if there is a true relationship, that thing is going to be a parameter. That thing is going to be rho. Well, I don't know how many sales calls are been, have been made, will ever be made. If there's a true relation between these things, I'm never going to have access to the population. So when we calculate these statistics, they are exactly that. They are statistics. They are all generated from a sample. In this case, I need the sample standard deviation of those 10 calls. Hey, there we go. Boom. Now we've got a standard deviation for the number of cars sold as well. Well, if I'm going to end up with a Z-score product that I can use, I need Z-scores for the number of calls made and the number of copiers sold. Z-score is the error. In other words, the number of calls made minus the mean, how far above or below it is, divided by the standard deviation. Notice I got a couple of dollar signs in there. That's going to help me copy these formulas very efficiently. Just like that. As I mentioned before, the number of, or sorry, the, the sum of the Z scores should always be zero. Whether it's for your X variable or for your Y variable, I can see right here, this person, this person, this person, this person, and these three people were all below average in terms of their number of sales calls. And as we noted before, Jeff, Greg, and Sonny all had above average numbers of sales calls. That's all well and good, but really what I'm concerned about is the Z score for the number of calls times the Z score for the number sold. That number that number copy it down and now I have a number of Z score products what I need to do now is add those all up and that's going to be the numerator of my formula the sum of those things a little more, a little more room a little more room there we go uh, the denominator is going to be how many things there are minus one which means our correlation is the numerator divided by the denominator 0.759 how do we know if we've done this right remember how i said there's a whole bunch of different formulas to calculate the correlation coefficient depending on the data that you have well we also happen to have excel if i say give me the correlation of calls to copiers sold yeah gives me the same number however this entire process here demonstrates how we use that formula and excel will calculate that number for us this value right here 0.759 that's r that's the correlation coefficient when we looked before at this presentation and said and here We've got a correlation right here of 0.75. We would call that a strong positive correlation. In fact, the number of sales calls increasing does increase the number of copiers sold. Make more calls to sell more copiers. If we wanted to test that beyond doing just a uh, just saying that it's got a strong correlation or a weak correlation, we would want to do a hypothesis test. The hypothesis test you can see here has a null and an alternate hypothesis. Let's start by interpreting the alternate hypothesis. Hypotheses that you do for hypothesis testing are always statements about the parameter. In this case, it's rho, R-H-O, that I alluded to earlier. Rho being the true correlation between these things. Are these two variables related? If rho does not equal zero, 
that means that rho is either some positive number or some negative number. But rho of zero means no relationship. These things are not related. So if I have to accept the null, I have to accept the statement that rho equals zero, that these two variables are not related at all. If I can reject the null, then I can say rho does not equal zero. And in fact, these two variables are correlated. When we do hypothesis tests for rho, for the correlation, the value here is always zero. We're always trying to test, does it exist or does it, excuse me, does it not exist? We can do this directionally too. We can say is rho greater than zero or uh, less than or equal to zero. Perhaps we're only concerned whether or not this is a positive correlation, so we make a directional hypothesis. This can be done directionally or non-directionally in the null hypothesis as it is for anything, whether it's equal, greater than, equal to, less than, equal to. Equality is always in the null, and inequality, whether it's less than, greater than, or not equal to, that's always in the alternate hypothesis. The hypothesis testing procedure is very similar to the stuff we've looked at before. When we did tests for means, if we had sigma, we would use our z statistic. If we had s, then we would use the t statistic. When we were doing tests for pi, we would always use z. Here, when we're doing tests for rho, we always use the t statistic. When we use the t statistic, we have to use the t table and we have to calculate a test statistic. Critical values come from tables. Test statistics come from formulas. In order to use the t-table, there's a few pieces of information we need. We need alpha, we need the number of tails, and we need the degrees of freedom. Whether we're doing a test for mean or we're doing a test for correlation, those are the three pieces of information we always need to get the t-value from the table. Things change just a little bit right here. Previously, when we used the t-table, we were doing so for univariate statistics. When we went to the table, degrees of freedom equals n minus 1. This is a bivariate relation, so we have to talk about degrees of freedom equaling n minus 2. That's it. We're not going into detailed discussion of degrees of freedom. All we're saying is that degrees of freedom when you're doing a correlation is n minus 2. So when you go to the table, you got to be mindful of that. Critical values come from the, the tables. Test statistics come from the formulas. And this is the formula for your test statistic. Two inputs. Size of your correlation, sample size. Put those things in there for your t-statistic, then go to the table, get your critical value, and you can do a hypothesis test just fine. Uh, one other thing to note, uh, to this point, I've always said that your test statistic, whether it's a z or a t, is sampling error divided by standard error. That formula down there for t, no different. It's still sampling error over standard error. But in this case, the sampling error, which is the statistic minus the parameter, minus rho always has rho equal to zero, which is why you don't see it in the formula down here. Also, the formula for standard error for the correlation here is the square root of one minus r squared divided by the square root of n minus two. The opposite way they're listed here, because when you divide by something, you're actually multiplying it times the reciprocal. This formula still follows the pattern of sampling error over standard error, but because rho is zero and the standard error equation is a little bit more complicated, it doesn't look like it. It is, it is, it is, it is. Keep this formula handy because it's the easiest way for us to calculate this given the information that we're going to have. Let's say we wanted to now do a statistical test. We determined from our previous example that the correlation was 0 0.759. 0 0.759 is the value for a correlation. Uh, we interpret it as being strong. But is it strong and statistically significant? Is it really not equal to zero? So we set up our hypotheses like these. Note that this is a non-directional hypothesis. Not because it's rho and r, and those are always non-directional, because that's not the case. Our example began by saying, is there a relationship between the number of sales calls and the number of sales made? When you start with something that's phrased like a question, like that, like, is it? I don't know. Um, and, and you feel like you don't have a direction on it. Yeah, it's non-directional like this one. So it's a non-directional hypothesis. Same thing applies. Non-directional is two tails, as you can see down here. 
The degrees of freedom, well, in order to use the T table to get our critical values, we do need three things. Alpha, which is 0 0.05, degrees of freedom here, which is n minus 2. n was 10, so n minus 2 is 8, and the number of tails is 2. You go to the table in the back of your textbook, or wherever you get a handy dandy T table, you use those three pieces of information, you find out that your critical values are 2.306 and negative 2.306. Now that we've got critical values, we've established the region of rejection. Note, when we do this stuff by hand, it always starts with the essential information. Sample size, correlation, that way we can get here, we've got alpha, that's essential information. Then we draw the picture down here. After we have, we've got this stuff, we've got our hypotheses, we draw the picture, we put our critical values on here. Now we got to calculate the test statistic. Well, the test statistic involves the formula, because that's where test statistics come from. R on top, N minus 2, 1 minus R squared. That gets us a test statistic of 3.297, which is over here. Mm -hmm, here. 3.297 is in the region of rejection, so we do get to reject the null hypothesis. We get to reject the statement of equivalence. We get to reject the notion that the number of sales calls and the number of sales are not related. We reject they are not related. We have enough evidence to accept these two things are related. That's where we end up at. We can reject the null. And the correlation in the population is not zero. It's something. What do we think it is? Well, our best guess for the population parameter is our sample statistic. Our sample statistic is 0.759. So we think we have evidence to say that uh, that rho, the true population correlation, is probably 0.759. And it's certainly not equal to zero. Once we have a value for r, which can range from negative 1 to positive 1, we also want to calculate something called the coefficient of determination. It's really easy to calculate. It's r squared, so you take r, 0.759 squared. You see that in the next slide. What it is, though, in terms of interpretation, it's the proportion of total variation in the dependent variable, y, that's explained by the independent variable, x. In other words, there's a lot of different things that can affect the number of sales someone makes. One of those things is the number of calls. If you don't make any calls, you're not making any sales. You can make a lot of calls, but if you're a bad salesperson, then you're not going to make any sales. A lot of it is a numbers game. A lot of it is how many people you can get a hold of. What do I mean by a lot of it? Coefficient of determination. That's what I mean. How much of that variation in the number of sales that were made can we say is attributable to the number of calls you made? Well, we take that correlation and we square it. And that gives us a percent, something between 0 and 100. It's a percent. There's no direction on it. There's no positive or negative. Anytime you square it, it's positive. But it gives us a percent. And that percent helps us understand how much variation in the number of sales, the dependent variable, is determined by our independent variable, the number of calls. So r squared is 0.576, found by 0.759 squared. The interpretation of r squared is 57.6% of the variation in the number of copiers sold is explained by the variation in the number of sales calls. And that's its determination. That's how you talk about it. So we've got the correlation, coefficient of correlation, and determination, coefficient of determination, which is R squared. Both of these things are all leading to how we can make predictions. If we find out that things are correlated, in other words, they vary together. One goes up, the other goes up. Maybe one goes up, the other goes down. As soon as we know that things are related, then we, the next step logically is to want to try to make predictions about things that we know are related. And we do so using regression analysis. In regression analysis, we use the independent variable x to estimate or predict the dependent variable y. Uh, in order to do this, relationship must be linear. If you check out the visualization example that's posted on Sakai, you'll know what I'm talking about. You'll see an introduction to nonlinear relations there. Both variables must be at least at the interval scale and talking about how the data is collected. Uh, and the least squares criterion is used to determine the equation. Uh, you can refer to your textbook for more detail in there. Mostly it's talking about how to minimize the distance between the points and the regression line. We'll see the regression line in a second. 
The regression equation is this equation that expresses how these two things are related. If you think back to pre-algebra, it's y equals mx plus b. The letters get shifted around and how they're defined is slightly different. But yeah, we're plotting a line. The least squares principle here is trying to minimize the sum of the squares of distances between the y's and the line. I'll show you here. Uh, We'll get to the equation in a second. But I keep talking about this least squares and these dots in this line. So this is those same 10 copier data points here. We could look at any number of these lines, for example, A here, and said, well, A kind of looks like the shape of the line, but the distance between here and here, that Y distance, or, or this distance to here, well, that's big. If I picked a line like, let's say, this green one or this purple one, well, then the distance between these dots and the line would be much smaller. The least squares principle is trying to decrease the distance between the line of best fit, the line that goes through these dots that minimizes that distance. That's its goal. It's trying to say which one cuts through these bets, which line looks most like these. Well, the line that looks most like them is this one. Y hat equals A plus BX. Y, the vertical, the dependent variable, Y hat is its predicted value. And we're going to make the prediction using the form A plus BX. Y hat is sometimes written as Y prime. Prime is an apostrophe. Uh, these things, we, depending on where you are, are slightly different. But the form maintains some similarity. A is your Y intercept. It's the value of Y when X equals zero. B is the slope of this equation, and it's derived directly from the correlation. X is some input value, so ultimately if you're trying to predict Y by calculating Y hat, if you're trying to make that prediction, you're trying to make that prediction for some given value of X. If I said X was 35, well, I would want some height along this line to indicate how many copiers sold I should expect at a certain point on the x-axis. These are the two parts that go into it, the slope and the y-intercept. The slope here is r times the standard deviation of y over standard deviation of x. Those are three pieces from this example that we have. We have the correlation, we have the two standard deviations, so we could quite easily calculate the slope. Once we have the slope, we put it into this equation, which will help us solve for y. We need at least one point that we know that's on the regression line. If we have a point and we have a slope, then we have a line. The only point we know exists on this line is the point where the two means intersect, x bar and y bar. So where those two averages are, we know that point exists. There could be other points along the line. Right now, we don't know. And we shouldn't use the raw data in here like we may have thought about when we were doing pre-algebra let's solve for a line because those line those particular dots may not be on the line we saw here that if this green line or this purple line happens to be the one that minimizes the distance from the dots well minimizing the distance from the dots doesn't necessarily mean the dot this data point for whoever it is doesn't mean that dot is necessarily on the line the only point we know exists on that line is the average for both We've solved for B previously, we've plopped that in there, we've got Y bar and X bar, now we can solve for A. That brings us back to having solved for A and having solved for B. If we want to make some prediction about Y, solving for Y hat, we would need an input X, how many sales calls were made. So we come back to this example talking about the number of sales calls and the number of copiers sold. We want to make a prediction. If someone makes 20 calls, how many sales do we think they're going to make? We look at this data right off the bat. We say, well, Tom Keller made 20 calls. He sold 30. I expect 30 copiers to be sold. Uh-uh-uh, not so fast, my friend. What about Richie Niles here? Richie sold or made 20 calls, but he sold 40 copiers. So maybe 20 calls should be 30 copiers or, or 40 copies. Or M Mike Kyle here, he's got 50 copiers. Mark Reynolds, he's got 30 copiers. We don't know based just on the people who made 20 calls how many we how many sales we can expect until we use the linear regression. We know from our previous example 
that the correlation coefficient is 0 0.759. S of Y is the standard deviation of Y, S of X. Uh, that gives us a B value of 1.18. One of the most common errors that people make when doing problems like this is because, generally speaking, you have X data and then Y data. When someone wants to calculate this B value, they'll take the correlation and then they're going to multiply it times uh, what should, should be the standard deviation of Y over X. But what people will do is say, oh, it's just the standard deviation divided by the other standard deviation. It's not one and the other, it's Y and it's X. And that's very important. That formula right there, wrong. What I'm really looking for is the correlation coefficient times standard deviation of Y divided by standard deviation of X, 1.18, and that's our B value. The A value comes simply from putting our Y bar of 45, a B value that we just solved for, an X bar in there, now we've solved for A. Here's the other thing that people sometimes forget. This, as simple as this formula looks to calculate A, the same sort of thing happens. People will put X bar where it should be Y bar because you, X is on the left. Y shouldn't be so here. Sometimes the B value, we forget to put the negative here. The third thing that happens is that, well, if we've got a negative thing here, let's say we solved for a negative B, B was negative 1.18, that the... The negative signs, if you're doing it by hand, you see one, so you assume it's one. You forget that a negative times a negative is a positive. Don't get tricked by how simple this stuff looks. It's very important that you just take exactly the piece that needs to go where and put it in there. But once we have those two pieces, then we have a regression equation. We start with y hat equals a plus bx, and that's our regression equation. Uh, we substitute in our A value and our B value here. The question was asking, well, what is our prediction for 20 sales calls? So we put 20 in for X, we solve for Y hat, and we see if someone makes 20 sales calls, based on our data of 10 reps, we expect that person to make about 43 sales based on our regression equation. The things we've talked about today. The independent and dependent variables, how to interpret a correlation, and how to calculate a correlation for that matter. Uh, we talked about how to do a statistical significance test for that correlation. We've interpreted the coefficient of determination, and we've also calculated a regression equation and used it to make a prediction for y. That's the end of chapter 13. I'm going to take a drink from a small water bottle, and that's it.